Hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Brooklyn Museum, or welcome back. It's so lovely to see you. Good evening, my name is Alicia Boone, and I am the Adult Programs Manager at the Brooklyn Museum. I'm truly honored to welcome you to this timely, urgent, and important discussion this evening. Tonight's talk celebrates not only the work of Zanelli Mahole, but her true commitment to activism and social justice. Zanelli Mahole meshes her work in photography, video, and installation with human rights activism to create visibility for the black, lesbian, and transgender communities in South Africa. Zanelli Mahole Isabanello Evidence, which is located on the fifth floor, fourth floor, is, has just opened yesterday, and today is our soft opening for the exhibition, so we invite you to go up to the exhibition directly following the talk. It is the presentation of the most comprehensive museum presentation of to date of her work, including several of her ongoing projects about the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex communities, both in her home country and abroad. This exhibition was curated by Catherine Morris, Sackler Family Curator for the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art, and Eugenie Sai, John and Barbara Vogelstein, Curator of Contemporary Art. Mahole urges all black, queer, and trans persons to document, revisualize, and rewrite their own his or her stories for prosperity, but most of all to be included and counted in national history, histories and historical archives in order to educate and sorry, in order to educate current and future generations of their existence and resistance. So tonight's discussion brings together South Af African artist Zanelli Mahole, Brooklyn-based poet Stacey Ann Chin, and visual artist and activist Tatiana Fazalizade to discuss LGBTQI issues and struggles across borders and class. Directly after the discussion, we will invite you to participate in a question and answer session and solution dialogue. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce Stacey Ann Chin. <laughs> Tatiana Fazalizade. and Zanelli Mahole. Because we wanted to make sure to get the conversation started, I'm gonna allow each artist to introduce themselves to you and provide you with a little bit of their background and bios. And like I said, please prepare your questions because we have a microphone here for you to engage in dialogue with them. And we thank you so much for coming and supporting this exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum. Thank you, Alicia, and thank all of you for being here tonight. Um, so like Alicia said, I think it would be great if we could just start by talking a little bit about ourselves, introducing ourselves. Um, talk a little bit about your work, too, if you don't mind. Is that? <laughs> My name is Stacey Ann. Uh, I'm a poet. I'm a, I don't know, I, I, I mess around with words in all the forms that they appear. I am um, a bit of a... a, a Whatever needs to be said, I try to figure out the language and say it in that language. Uh, a rabble rouser of sorts, uh, dissenter, um, mother of a three-year-old. Um, I left Jamaica when I was 24 years old because I came out as a lesbian and was um, sexually assaulted by a bunch of boys. And I thought to myself, I'd like to go somewhere where freedom rings and brave, the home of the brave, free, blah, blah, blah. And I, came to America expecting all of that and then realized I was black. <laughs> and so, you know, I've been, I don't know, I guess complaining about that and yearning for palm trees since. Okay. I think I have to take off my jacket so please, I'll be pink. Please, take off. Okay. <laughs> Uh, my name is Anelem Mholi. I'm a visual activist. My dream when I was young was to sit next to Stacey and Chin. <laughs> she said she messed up with weights. She has messed up with a lot of spaces in South Africa, and now I'm here. <laughs> I'm here, <laughs> talking to the weight diva. Um, to be serious, I take photographs because I just want to make sense. And thanks to Shao Tasmit, 
who introduced me to this space. In 2007, I came to New York for the first time, I think, and I was greeted by this person. Please raise, rise. <laughs> Um, at the Audre Lorde Project, Lesbian History Archives, and she took me through a lot of documents that I never thought that they existed. And I must say, you truly inspired me with your intelligence and also how you took care of me that day. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to see you again in eight years, or after eight years. Um, I was born in Umlazi, Durban, which is a township in Durban. And Durban is one of... Um, the, the cities, like how you have New York here, Deben is one of the famous cities uh, in South Africa. It's situated in Guazulu Natal, and Guazulu Natal is a province, one of the nine provinces, just to give you some context. Um, I'm born by a Zulu mother and by a Malawian father, and if I was born in Malawi, I would not have came out. So luckily, I was born in Natal. And it is the only province with the president and the king and me. <laughs> uh, I just, uh, I just uh, thought to myself when I was young, um, it was important for us to see, uh, to see ourselves in the pictures. And I ever questioned the position and the privilege of men who had cameras and who managed to take photographs of our birthdays, those who were lucky enough to have birthdays, and also weddings of our sisters and brothers who were getting married back then. And as I came out, I came out to myself, because there's a personal come out and a public coming out. And I just related my story. I thought maybe <laughs> I share the story with Stacey and maybe for the second time today. Anyway, then I came out when I was 16. Then I had to come out roughly again when I was 22 to my mother, which means that if we were graduates in these coming out sessions, I'll be having a lot of degrees. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm born in Durban. I have a brother, um, three sisters, and me. So my mother was okay about my sexuality. Unfortunately, she's no longer there to hear about my being in New York at Brooklyn Museum, which is such a privilege to be here. Because mm -hmm. not everybody and anybody get to be here. I mean, seriously, yeah. But anyways, um, yeah. Yeah. Great. I'll share some more. Okay. Um, now we are here at the Brooklyn Museum because of the art. But I think both of you, myself included, we use our art as a tool for activism. So I really want to talk about how art is important when it comes to activism, how art reaches people in different ways than other mediums do, um, especially in the LGBTQ community. Um, how is art important to you in your art that you're making, or activism important to you in the art that you're making? Um. To me, art, especially photographs and words which together they need to connect all the time, it's beyond the word important, it's, it's needed. It's so much needed, especially at this particular period in South Africa, in America, at the height of racism that is persisting and ongoing. I just came here, a black man was killed, and I thought to myself, if only every second person of color and a black person take their own images of their families, not only when a brother is killed, not only when a mother is killed, not only when a lesbian is brutally murdered, not only when a, a young woman is raped, we need to document our history. It's not a matter of even negotiating the space or whatsoever. It, it needs to happen right now. The materials at schools where we go to, from higher primary schools to kindergarten, the crutches where our kids go to, they need to consume our history, they need to be fed our realities, do not be brainwashed simply because people think that, oh, we'll negotiate how to fit you in in history books later. History, our voices, ourselves, our beings, yeah. Mm. So how I connect my reality to the mainstream realities, 
I should. Because right now I'm capable to do so. And there are many people who came before me who had voices but did not have equipment to do so. So for me, it's not even like, how are we doing it? When are we doing it? We're just doing it. We do it. We do it. It's, it's force. We have to do it by force. Because when we go on, my grandchild won't be able to read about my existence and your existence and everybody's existence if somebody do not take a stand and do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, came to, um, I came to art not as a, a, as a student of art. I didn't, you know, I, I read literature as a child and loved it and studied literature and thought I would become a professor of some sort where I would, you know, comment on literature and have like political conversations in a classroom. And um, I think when I graduated college, they said like, where do you see yourself in 10 years? And I said, I think I'm gonna be a professor teaching English literature somewhere and um, I might write a poem or two on the side. Um, and then when I landed in the US uh, with what felt to me n no voice, because I had used all my resources to flee what I thought was a kind of um, brutal place where I thought I was going to come to this place with at least less brutality. Um, and I, I happened upon racism here and I, I found uh, the same spaces, the same struggles with regard to sexism and um, classism and certainly some xenophobia as a, a, an immigrant and definitely as a person of color. And I thought to myself, fuck man. Like, this is some fucking shit. Like, you know, I, I have to survive. I have to, like, find somewhere to put this anger, this deep, like, what seemed to me, like, out of left field anger because I really came here to be free. You know, I mean, this is what America sells. Like, when you come, you get free. This is what they tell you. Like, all the brochures say it. I mean... <laughs> So, I mean, you come here and, like, I just was so angry and I missed Jamaica and it was so cold and I was like, who the fuck builds houses where it feels like a freezer, you know? Um, and then I happened upon the poets in, on the Lower East Side and so I think I came to poetry as, as a weapon, as, a, as, as a, a, a kind of battle cry, a kind of... Um, angry placeholder for my feelings, for places, for things I, I didn't know what to do with. I, I, I don't think that I came at it with this like, oh, I'm going to be a poet. How does one become a poet? No, I was in the New Recon like yawping and stomping my feet and, you know, having eggs late at night and deciding like which poet, poetry cafe we we're going to go read the next crazy angry poem. Um, and then I, I started hanging out with Howard Zinn and I started reading um, June Jordan and they were like, okay, so you're very concerned about what you're going to do with your pussy. Like, you're very concerned about this being a lesbian and having sex thing, but what about, like, you know, other parts of you, you know, being black or being a person of color or being a woman? And um, that's when I started thinking about, like, all the parts of me and how to put all the parts of me in a poem and how to how to make sure that who, who I was as an entirety existed in the work I created, in the work I read, um, and how to look for it in, in places like your photographs. You know, uh, I remember I was in Canada brooding over some woman who had left me, if you, if you believe my version of, of things. Um, and you know, Canada is mad cold, so I was like, like, I, I was kind of forehead down on the floor of somebody's kitchen, like, you know, just kind of bitching about the fucking, like, whatever happened. And, um, and somebody said, uh, you know, like, how you're talking about her body now makes me want to, like, do, have you seen, like, this book by this, like, South African artist, like, Zanele Moholi or Mohululi or whatever? 
and they pulled out the book and I, I, I was, you know, the small one that you did? It's like, and I, I was like, my God, man, like, shit, is that blood? <laughs> like, you know, and, and so I was flipping through these images and I was like, it's kind of sexy. Like, I'm less heartbroken now. <laughs> And they immediately connected us. We had a phone conversation that yeah, evening, yeah. I think. Um, and your work has been present with me ever since. And like, I, I, I pull it out, you know, like, I told you I was somewhere um, in a very compromising situation with a person. And um, I looked up from my position and your photograph was on the wall. <laughs> so, so there's a way that like the lesbian identity globally, you know, <laughs> has kind of taken on this like, you know, this, this, this evidence of like, oh my goodness, like, I'm a lesbian, like, I should have one of these images in my house because, you know, it makes me feel connected to other lesbians in other places, you know. Uh, there's a young kid in, in, um, who came from the same township you came from who, who speaks of being, um, who, who speaks of saying, oh, like, coming out is, shouldn't be the acme of my lesbian career, I could be, like, a professional because, like, Zaneli Moholi is a professional, so... It's just astounding to me. Like these images do more than just, you know, provide room for people to, you know, gawk and, you know, look at. And, and, and I look up there at the. I went to the. I went up there just now, and it was just amazing to stand against that wall and to see all this black swagger. You know, like sexy, like variations of sexy just lining the wall. I like that, you know, because sometimes, you know, when we're talking about like hard things and we're presented in this activist way, we don't look sexy and we're not sexy all the time. Look, look, at, look at the room. <laughs> yeah, everybody I know is super fly and super fresh when it comes to the <laughs> queer community, especially here in Brooklyn. Um, but you bring up a good point, I, I think, talking about looking at it globally, right? Um, I think about um, the queer community, especially people of color here in the U.S. and the, the struggles that happen when we talk about discrimination and um, lack of legal protections and violence. There's real violence that comes across, comes across the community. And so here we have um, a Jamaican-born lesbian, a black South African lesbian. What are the connections between the international queer community? And how well, do we work in solidarity <laughs> with each other? Why is that uh, South Africa is, <laughs> you know, South Africa is really Jamaica, <laughs> but with oh, a yeah, bigger yeah, economy. You know? <laughs> okay. But yeah, what are those connections and how do we like work in solidarity, recognizing the differences, but also recognizing all of the similarity, similarities? You're joking, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the commonalities um, is our sexuality. There is the connections with our race, obviously, and the discrimination that you guys face here surely happens in other parts of the world as well, but especially in South Africa. I don't know Brooklyn that well. I don't know Harlem that well. I don't know this place. I just came, I always come here to work. But I know that when somebody looks at you here, could see, like right now, you see all races, you see, you see the rainbow that we speak about at home. Most people were looking at our pictures at home. They look at Makesh and Pastor Zungu. They thought they were from New York, and people from New York were from home, <laughs> which was so funny. But yeah, I think what's common between us, especially as women, the blood that we share, you know, Bleeding, that's what's common you know, between us. The fact that we are born by mothers and fathers who are not queer, but who feel the pain when some of us are being murdered, that we share the common, you know, uh, pain, you know, because it doesn't matter whether Stacey Enchin is here when she is in South Africa at a protest of a lesbian who is murdered or who was murdered, she feels the pain as a mother, as a sister, as a lesbian, as a female-bodied being, you definitely feel the pain. So there's so much that we share beyond just the sexuality that we take pride, pride of when we speak of being in space or so. And there are maybe differences on how you do things in terms of culture. 
Stacey Ann Chin, maybe it's because she's from Jamaica. She swears a lot. She still has an accent. <laughs> I won't dare say a lot of F words in front of my sisters because maybe they might connect that with my sexuality. So I'll have to tone down a little bit. But the pain, the loss, discrimination that persists, that our people, you know, continue uh, to face at the hands of homophobes becomes an issue. And also the struggles of coming out, maybe there and then, and maybe for people who come from Caribbean countries, coming out is not as easy as people who come from maybe Ethiopia or maybe the people who are here born by pe people or parents from different African countries might find it difficult to be as out as mm -hmm. we. Mm -hmm. And I think what then come on between just us seated here is not um, being scared to say who we are. Whereas many people in the same positions, maybe most writers won't write or even mention the P word and the F word in their writing because they're scared to be censored. Mm -hmm. And maybe most photographers who are in my positions who love women and sleep with women almost every day or every week will even be scared to say who they are. Mm -hmm. So our love for women becomes that common common thing, you know, and also not being scared to say who we are and for the benefit of many who are really, you know, crying in the closet, dying to come out in every way, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm talking about not only the arts, because what we're doing is beyond the arts. There are so many beneficiaries in all of this mm -hmm. that we are mm -hmm. doing, mm -hmm. you know, because when people read Stacey Ann's work, they see themselves or they could smell themselves in their text. And when they see some of the photographs that I produce, they also could connect their realities to our own, regardless of where we're situated. And Zanele, it's also important to, to, to point out how infrequent images of LGBT people of color occur in literature, in art. Um, we know that we've had them. And they exist, many of them, you know, everyone knows the guy in, on the church choir who's gay. Everyone knows, you know, the, the woman who, you know, he's, she's 45, but she's still changing roommates every two or three years. It, like, <laughs> you know, like everyone kind of knows this person, but, um, but to be able to, 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 to see them and to, to access them we live in this world where so many people, you know, particularly, you know, white people, I assume is only good white people in, in this audience. Um, but, but there are lots of white people who, who occur in literature. You know, when I first ca came to the U.S. and I, I found a book about two lesbians from Montana, you know, who were like coming out to their family. Like, I read that text and decided I was going to go home and use this story as a text for coming out. <laughs> In my Jamaican context, which, God, I mean, like, if, some, if, you know, if only there was, like, a, 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 a Zanele Moholy, you know, kind of text to follow, if there was a Stacey Anchin who would kind of say, well, you can't really go home and tell people, like, okay, either you just, so I eat pussy, so what, in Jamaica, in 19, you know, 97. Do you know what I mean? Like, you, you just chill, like, for a second. There, there are ways to do it. Um, I just feel like the more stories we have, the more we increase visibility, the more uh, we, we seem diverse to people, except for the three or four gay people that you know, maybe are on TV. I feel it's really, really important to, to say how, like, I think your work, I look at the wall, like, have you looked upstairs? This shit is astounding, like, it's epic. When you look, there's a whole wall of people. So can you imagine, I know so many, like, queer people from the continent who are like, I've never met one of us. Oh my God. And I'm like, I've met like so many of you and <laughs> been close to so many. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy. Like the more images you have, like that wall, when, when, when a young queer person of color of African descent or even from the continent passes by that wall, like you can literally see the back straighten. You can literally see like the pride kind of come rushing through. It's like, and these people are not like mid 
violence, like being beaten up. Like, do you see them? Like, the, the sexiness, the like, the, 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 the yes, I would like to go out on a date with you look on them out there. It's like sexy. And I think that that is so important because so many of us who are immigrants and from countries deemed developing as opposed to developed, um, you know, we, we always seem as if we were like, we, we always need like somebody to come brush us up or help us. You know, we're fighting, but we're like sexy warriors. Just so free, everybody in the room. Questions. Feel free to take photos. Yeah. Let's shoot each other. It's fine. You don't need to hide your iPhones, iPhone 6 Plus. <laughs> it's fine. This take is photos. history in making. There's hashtags and yes. everything. I don't know yeah. what the hashtag is, yeah. but I think so it's So please feel somewhere. free. Yeah. And, we, and I would Doing like it. to, like, you know, instigate like a more communal conversation. Like, I mean, you know, you could kind of like go and Google us and you'll hear all of what we think. <laughs> but we'd like to be in conversation. You've been kissing a lot of people for so long. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't. Yeah, no, the, the work Questions. is accessible, so we'd like to open up. I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Yeah, go of course. Ahead. If anybody has questions, um, I know that Stacy is going to have to run in a bit, so. Feel free, we can jump in and make this a very casual and yeah. communal conversation, sure. absolutely. I like it now. Yeah. We have a mic here if you want to ask a question. Shoot. Yeah. Okay. It's like me, I tell people cool. go ahead and steal the book for the copy. It. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I can't afford it, get it, get it. Yeah, um, hi, thank you so much. I, um, I came with you know my family here and I did not know that we, we came to see Candee Wiley's exhibit, and I'm so, so glad that as soon as I walked in, I was like running to the restroom, and I heard Stacey in the chin, I got so geeked, I was like, oh my God, let me hurry up and pee, and let me run out there. <laughs> because I was like, oh my God, this is fascinating. What? I am, the universe, you know, it just, it works how it does, and I am so grateful that you guys are here. This is amazing. As someone who has uh, parents that are, you know, um, well, family, my family is uh, continental Africans, but I was born and raised here. Um, and, you know, I'm cis hetero, uh, you know. Say, th say that again, continental. continental. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you right. understand the difference with that context? Yeah, okay. So my, my, my mother and father, right, are from Senegal and Guinea, and I was born and raised here in Harlem. Um, and I've gone back home and, um, I mean, I struggle at home with uh, the conversations around this because I am someone who's, you know, very open, but I, I also struggle for my family back home because I do have, you know, um, members of my family who I know are very sheltered and very afraid, you know, um, with the idea, especially where my family's from, you know, mostly like 99, 98% Muslim countries. Um, the conversations, are beginning to happen more so in Senegal than in Guinea, but um, they're happening, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that that's happening. Um, but the, the persecution that our people are facing back home, it's, it's, it's so disheartening and it's, like, it's hard to talk about, but I'm trying to find ways, you know, and, and you guys as artists, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I would love some pointers on ways to begin dialogue um you know with those that are willing at least um pointers if you have any on you know i want to i want to begin by sticking a pin in that like um you know people are suffering in this way back home there's no back home this like killing of lgbt people this killing of brown bodies this killing of bodies of color is fucking global there is no country on the planet in which brown bodies or LGBTQI bodies are not being killed every day. Let's just begin there. Like, I'm so sick and tired of this, like, finger pointing, like, okay, the government is on top of this one, and, like, the government is, like, behind this killing, so, you know, and these laws are not being supported here, and Jamaica is this, and South Africa is this, like, this shit is happening in Brooklyn, this shit is happening in New York, everywhere in New York. This shit is happening in the South. Like, 
I want to like just stop that conversation. In some places, it's probably more urgent. In some places, it's probably more brutal. In some places, it is more overt. In some places, it is more identifiable. But and even like this idea that, you know, that, that all of a sudden, like, what's happening with these policemen killing all these black boys? These black boys been dying for a long time from Emmett fucking Till. Right? I mean, come on, man. Like, like. So this business of being an activist, this business of taking on this conversation, even at the familiar level, even like in this kind of like, I'm going to like speak out about it at work. Like, like for me, like, I, I don't encourage this kind of like part-time activism. Like, you got to be in it. You have to, like, I, I encourage people to take it on. Some of us are gorillas and, like, do it mad quiet and tiptoe around the, like, water fountain and, like, have conversations with people in this kind of, like, way. What, however you do it, I think it's necessary. It needs to be done and we have to do it. But we have to stop talking about it as if it's only, like, in one section or it's in one family or in one country. Like, this idea of killing bodies that are not straight, white, cleaver-like families is a part of the white patriarchy. Is a part of like how white men a long time ago decided that only white men were valuable and everybody else who was not a white man of a certain ilk was gonna have to go down or was gonna have to be a laborer or was gonna have to be owned or in some way. So I think if you begin by talking about it from that perspective, then, it became, then you can see how it's a global conversation and how it is that, okay, maybe some people are under more pressure and then they're killing more people, like whether it's an economic pressure. Like how the hell are you going to like run around and try to save Jamaicans who are like gay, but you couldn't give a shit about like Jamaican women who are 12 and 13 who are being raped daily? Like it's, like it's got to be like a multi-issue conversation. You cannot ask people to come out in, 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 in protection and service and celebration of LGBTI people in Jamaica when we couldn't care less about poor people or people who are dying or women who are being raped. And so I begin there by talking about my own body as a lesbian, which is kind of like a body that is straight and black and poor and lives in a place like Trenchtown or lives in a place like Canterbury in Jamaica or lives in a place like Kailicha in South Africa. Like the, it, it's, it's we are the same person and it's the same eight white men in that corner. If we could just line them up and put them in that corner, then we probably could get a handle on like patriarchy and how it is that it proliferates and you know, kind of like fools us into thinking that it's more than one thing. Like this, let, this, 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 this corrective rape is not about just being lesbian, it's about being women and, and our bodies and the power that we have in them and ownership of them and how they think that we should be using them and how because it's shut down or it's not, it's not accessible to you. But I understand that you have to like start small, but I think that if you, if you start the conversation and start, start the conversation in a way that includes the causes that people are affected by or they care about you know like every, I, I never ever start a conversation on the island of Jamaica with just being lesbian I start talking about rape that splits the room already and you start throw like classism and poverty in there and then the room splits again and then all of a sudden like it's a different conversation it's an entirely different conversation if it is that we are willing to hear each other's pain and it's like it's like it's like Zanelli said that you have like pain is common, you know the pain of being excluded as a an LGBT person. You know it it it's, it can be alluded to the you know you can kind of line it up with the pain of being excluded because you're black, or because you're a woman, or because you're poor. Mm. Any? I have a question questions? right here. We also have a hashtag queer trans activism, so that's also another way to continue the dialogue is to participate in the conversations that are happening globally. Behind you. So Stacey Anchin, I had the pleasure of seeing you about six or eight years ago at Little Red, Elizabeth Irwin, Little and you changed Red. my world. Oh my god, how and old how are I you? see it. I was probably a sophomore in high school Jesus. or something like that. And you really reframed my thinking uh, about diversity, 
about LGBTQ issues. And I think education is something that we really got to start talking about these issues at a younger age. My mother is an educator of elementary school kids. And I'm wondering, also as a South African, my father is Zulu. Um, Your father is Zulu? Yes. Maybe and I he's am, my uncle. Yes. <laughs> And, and seeing the xenophobia against people like me, who is his daughter, I mean, there are so many levels of education that we have to start discussing issues of hate of our own people at a younger age. How do you guys suggest we approach these in educational spaces and introduce it to youth? Issues of race and LGBTQ. Okay, I'll come on. Uh, it's nice to be young because when we talk about being young, we always think that the people who came before you have all the knowledge that you possess. <laughs> um, there are so many people who are adults who never had access to anything that you as youth need to consider when you talk about your youthful, beautiful selves. It's very, very, very important. My mom uh, had to suffer under apartheid regime. She had no schooling. She had to work as a domestic worker, of which some of my work touches on that, serving the next person, being the distant other. Yet at the same time, she had her own kids to fend for. She didn't have the opportunity that maybe your mom, maybe your mom had access to. You are young, have access to Stacey and Chin. There are so many Stacey and Chins who never had even an opportunity to be published. So now, what do we do? I work with a lot of youth, and that's my boy. I travel with them because I don't want to be the only person who gets these opportunities to travel. I train them to be the next Zanelem Holis when I cannot. So there's a need uh, for sharing skills, and there's a major need to have intergenerational dialogues in every province, in every city, in any other space there is there to be. Because the generation that came before your mother, they are intellectual, you know, uh, experts. Uh, sorry, they are intellectuals that never had to share their expertise because whatever that is not academically reviewed does not exist according to experts. And yet those people are the ones who shared oral histories for ages before we. So your grandmother, who is a Zulu, that has her own clan name, that history that we're supposed to research and dig to write a new history is in your hands. Just because maybe she's in a different planet or different space does not mean that she's not worthy. So I know it sounds like an old thing, and it's because we have Twitters, we hashtag. I think it's very important for the living ancestors to converse with those uh, that uh, the upcoming generations and take these oral histories and mix them with the text that is written by Stacey and Chin, mix them with the visual will have a good family document that will speak to the next generations to come. Because maybe you connected to Shaga Zulu, who knows? You need to dig down into your history and open up from your own school and tell them where you come from. And also that lineage becomes something massive. But now is the time for us to speak because maybe there's nothing like race. Maybe the people that we're scared of, they are family. We're so much connected with them because in other places where you go, they say, no, if a person is not born in Europe, she or he is not white, white, white. If without blue eyes, maybe it means that you're not 100% white. I've heard a lot of stories of shades of white and many shades of black. So I don't know what anymore, but there's a need for us to dig deep into these histories and start this intergenerational dialogues every day. Not only when your grandmother dies and you start tracing now. No, do it now while you still have access to her, while you still have access to your grandfather. It's the simplest way to do. And we also record with every little bit of something that we have. 
keep that voice because that voice is beyond richness. Just to hear your 90 year old grandmother speaking to you in ways that you never thought that it's ever existed. It means that you have the treasurable grandmother ever. I was looking upstairs at uh, this guy, um, Michel Basquet, and when I look at his face, and my faces and faces, we look so much the same. Here's this guy who didn't smile when he was confronted by the lens, and you wonder what was he thinking of at that particular time. He is no more, and that guy is somebody's uncle, and that guy is somebody's grandfather, and yet we stuck with the image. So start those conversations, encourage your friends to write, tweet and hashtag your living ancestors and your late ancestors, because it's the right thing to do. Zanella, I'm a South African as well. So good to, <laughs> good to see you here representing. Um, Thank you. About five years ago, uh, my girlfriend's sister was raped at the age of 12. And it's still one of the greatest tragedies of my life. And it began a sort of internal dialogue in myself. What is, a, what is my role as a man in a world where women are sexually assaulted, young girls? And it's still something that it's, 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 it's my great quest, I suppose, at this point, to try and understand what it is my role should be. I'd like to kind of hear your thoughts on how you feel men should be acting, responding. What you'd like to see from us, what you'd like us to be doing. Because a lot of this debate happens amongst women, and you guys are up here, but you know, what, where are the male voices that are in support? I feel like, please give me that mic. It's painful. It's really, really and deeply painful because every woman's rape, you know, a lot of community members, they either suffer in many ways because one uh, female body being raped, it means that the police need to take a stand, the family need to take a stand beyond just your family. The nurses need to take a stand, etc., etc. And if there's any lack of evidence, from the nurses or from the policemen, it means that we lose the case. Not your family, but we lose the case, because it means that by losing that case, another woman gets raped the following day, knowing that somebody will get away with it. Uh, the idea that I had was, um, um, I started a project with men. Uh, I want to shoot men, 100 men, and then speak to those 100 men to find out if any one of them never committed any sexual assault in their lives for the reason because i've been thinking if we keep on speaking to each other about this rape stacy n is angry tatan is angry we it's only we who are angry and then there's a man who is roaming around our streets freely and he got away with a young girl's life easily and that girl will be damaged for the longest period and we're not saying anything one of the most painful... Okay, let me respond to your question first. We need to have conversations with men because the rapist might be my, my sister's boyfriend. The rapist is my friend's brother. Son. The rapist is my uncle's son. Do you understand? He's my cousin. These things are happening in our families. We can't do away with it. Whether one is white or black and so on, we need to deal with them as an issue that needs to be attended urgently. So the conversations between men, for men to help women to live freely in the streets in any space is long overdue. I'm not talking about one million much when just the case of one rape or a brutal case of hate crime takes place. It needs to be an everyday thing and should also be introduced at our schools as part of the syllabus. Education, education is very important. And also to say that's a young girl who got, you know, raped. There are a lot of young boys who are molested on a daily basis also whose cases never make it to court and again the rapists roam around our streets freely mm -hmm. conversation between men for men to make our spaces safe is long overdue 
starting with our presidents, to our politicians, to our mothers who protect their sons at court. Because also, we as women are a problem. We want to defend the rapist's sons at court. I've seen it, many cases that I've attended. A young person was stoned to death in Cape Town, Zolis Wangonyane, and the girlfriends supported the rapists and those perpetrators. The mother of the, the, the murderer said, he didn't do that, my son won't do that. Also, the conversation with our mothers who protect their sons that they regard as pure and innocent is much needed. Because if your father says, my son didn't kill somebody, your father says, my son won't do that, and even bail him out, that when it becomes a problem, because it means that we're not getting anywhere as the community members, as the nation, as a family. There are a lot of cases that happen within families, the incest, and you end up with children that are born from that mess. People are not speaking about that. And a girl's child is destroyed from early. She has no future because she had to become her uncle's wife. This is a problem that is long overdue, which is why Stacey and Chin, that we can't part-time activism. We working as artists, and unfortunately, artists do not get funding to preach because we regard it as, as deviants or transgressors. But artists have managed to articulate a lot of issues that are not dealt with by our own politicians. Mm -hmm. But many people who are in positions of power, who refuse to speak out because they want to to, to, to save their positions. So conversation in every space and no young girl need to be raped, no young boy need to be raped, no any person, whether female or male, should be raped because of who they are. This is long overdue. We need to act soon before it's too late. I am. You know, I, I, my kid is, is three, as I said, and we've been talking about consent for three years. Um, you know, one of the things that people ask me to do now, I go into colleges to put out fires around campus climate and rape and sexual assault and all of that. As soon as, like, some shit blows up and Title IX is, like, flying left, right, and center on the campus, like, they... They, they, they send you an, uh, an urgent email, could you please come here and run two workshops and talk to the fat boys and oh my God, quiet the, you know, the raging lesbians who are screaming in the corner. Um, and so I go into these classrooms, I go into these uh, frat houses, I go into these meeting places and one of the things I find that is quite frightening is that when you're invited to high school to talk about consent, to talk about rape culture, your hands are tied behind your back and your tongue is tied to your feet. No one wants you to say anything to these kids about consent. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, they arrive at college and everyone wants them to already know what the fuck they're supposed to know already. So I don't really understand this notion. So I believe in talking about consent. And consent, you don't, I mean, I don't talk to Zuri about like, you know, oh, no one should touch your vagina in that kind of overt, scary way. But I say to her, this is your knee. And no one should be touching it unless you say so. Not even me. Even if it requires like long dressing sessions because when she's getting dressed and she's like, it's my body, you can't touch my body. I'm like, fuck man. <laughs> Trying to get through the door. But like, if I'm, go if I'm gonna support that, then I'm gonna have to be late. And like, when I arrive, I'm like, listen, we had a consent issue and so like, <laughs> I'm a little late. Uh, it, uh, but you know, I, I have to, to, to dash out because I need to, to be somewhere else shortly. But I want to leave you with a poem, and I think, um, I think that uh, we're going to have more conversation after with... Is it going to happen with that? Or we don't know? Yeah. 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 Okay. So I, I want to read this poem because this, this poem talks about like the, the, the vagina in this kind of wonderful way. Um, <laughs> Women have always been the center of things beautiful for me. Becoming woman has always been the center of my girlhood. The sum of my thighs, my ankles, even my shoulders were always girl. And when I bled for the first time, I told my best friend, wrapped my secret in her ear, assured her that this blood meant that we could make babies. 
But being a girl in Jamaica in 1980 also meant I had to run faster than my cousin's fingers, farther than his sweaty palms reaching for my hands. My tiny breasts had to be brave against his fury when I refused. And one night I stabbed him, pencil point sliding swift into his flesh. The whole house cried out, and I was so proud of my yellow pencil, point sharp and without fear. My aunt beat me anyways. For making your cousin bleed, she said, and I cried more out of loneliness than anything. The other cousin's name still remains quiet upon my tongue. I speak of him when I'm angry or sad or afraid of things that do not make noises in the dark. Stark raving mad, he showed me his dick, told me, you smell like a woman in that little girl's body. Hips barely budding, he cornered me in the hallway, in the bathroom, and when I bled, I washed quick and quiet. Years later, the motherfucker still smiles at me. Even now, no apologies are necessary. I was only a girl. Quick and quiet, girls learn to wash the details away, bury them under briefs and jeans and cargo pants. Under these panties rests the story of these chochas, these twats, these bushes that bleed on time. Once a month, I'm reminded that my pussy can do something no dick or tomcat can. I dare you to make people without a vagina. Shiva or man or beast, even Jesus had to pass through a punani. Angels and messages aside, Mary had to lend passage to God or them Christians might still be Jews waiting for a Christ that was stuck up the ass of some man who thought he could do what little girls do every day against their wishes. They are forced to do what they do not want to do every day against or wishes. We carry these common stories of sons and fathers and cousins who violate the sanctity of our bodies and our breasts, our ability to make breath from passion or the neat decision of a fucking intent. One day, and you know, it wasn't so long ago, my body bloomed a little miracle called Zuri Siale Semanya Chin. The mouths around me open wide and wander and terror. Every day, men are forced to ponder the magic of what vaginas do. Every day. Every day, women carry people into being. And every day, even on the most petrifying day, I stand grateful I was born. Bloody snatch in just the right place. Today, I'm so fucking glad I was born a girl. Especially since yesterday, my mother told me, go ahead and write a story. No matter that I will write her in unflattering truths, right, she told me. And I hope the book sells so you can afford to raise your daughter with a heart like yours. And everything was better between us. Everything was better between us. It didn't matter that she left me twice. Didn't matter that in Jamaica in 1972, she chose her safety over mine. Yesterday, my mother told me, right, daughter, and the world righted itself. Ah, I wish every mother whose daughter survived the burial of these unspoken things would give her permission to say what happened, to write down how she endured the terror of being that small girl in a world that so deeply favors large, brutal men. I wish every cunt had the courage to bear public witness. I wish everyone had a pen, a camera, a clear view, and the support she needs to scream. What happened to me was not my fault. What happened to me was not my fault. What happened to me was not my fault. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stacey Ann Chien. So we're going to have this conversation, right? We have to have this conversation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So when do you leave? I'm good, sir. All right, Stacey has to leave. Thank you so much for that and for being here and a part of this conversation. We do want to keep talking, so if anybody else has questions, please feel free, and we can keep the conversation going. Thank you so much. This Mad great. love, Brooklyn, and I, I want to say big up to like Brooklyn Museum for having like a, a whole slew of like South African LGBTQI people like in three rooms upstairs. Like, I mean, barring the fucking gentrification, it is ah. Uh, Amazing, and I, I can't even tell you how amazing it is. I love you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Um, this is more of a statement than a question, and, and before Stacey and Chin runs off, I just want to say to both, to everyone here, um, thank you. I want to say thank you for giving voice to those who could not uh, tell their own voice. I was upstairs um, looking at 
accidentally looking at your, the, um, the thing upstairs, and I got really sad um, because, you know, these were, some of the, the, the stories that are upstairs, um, some of them are no longer here. Um, and you know that's hard for me to wrap my head around that someone 19, someone 25 could, um, was murdered for being who they were. So I want to say again, thank you from the bottom of my heart for giving a voice to those who could not uh, tell their own story or give their own voice. Thank you for the words. Thank you for the pictures. And um, continue. And to this gentleman here, um, I'd like to say, how can we as men, um, what can we do? And what we can do is we can get involved and we can do, we can do things. Um, we can be allies um, because nobody does anything alone. So when you see injustice happening, when you see um, someone who's hurt, help them in any way that you can. Um, I'll tell a very, very quick story about, um, I used to volunteer at a, a, a women's domestic abuse shelter. Um, when I was first asked to do it, I, didn't, I, I just couldn't figure out why I was asked to do this. Um, after volunteering there, I realized that for a lot of the women that were there, and for a lot of the children that were there, most of them were uh, black and brown children, and they had never, ever had a positive black male role model in their life. And so that was my, uh, that was the, my responsibility to do that for that year that I was there. That was my responsibility. So get involved, um, do what you can, um, and others will follow. So thank you. Yeah, and if I can just, because I get that question a lot too, just yeah, how can men be involved? Just to answer it, I guess, for the last time. Um, I think it, it, it comes down to realizing that this stuff happens all the time, every day. And it's not just the rape, it's not just the assault. It's all these other actions and gestures and interactions that happen all the time, every day, that enables that stuff to happen, that enables rape to happen, right? So when you have a friend or you have a cousin, you have a family member that's making sexist comments, like intervene, step in. It's about making stuff not acceptable anymore. It's not acceptable to be homophobic. It's not acceptable to be racist or sexist. So any comment, any gesture that somebody does, step in and be like, that's not okay, that's not cool. And all of that leads to a shift in our society where this stuff is not okay and people don't feel enabled to just rape someone and get away with it. So. That's my answer to that, too. Um, we have a question over here. Yeah, sure. Hi, so I'm coming from this perspective of the, around the topic of young people and education again. Um, I work with young people. I lead a program of about 300 girls. It's an all-girls program. Um, and I find that definitely in me just being visibly and voca vocally queer, that creates a safer space for a lot of young women. Um, but when we're talking about rape and consent and we're talking about sexism, you know, we're talking about misogyny and all these things, you know, I want us to kind of open up the conversation and understand that like sexism and misogyny is something that's like not necessarily just like coming from men towards women and that women exercise misogyny against each other. And so I'm wondering, especially in figuring out for my girls who are anywhere between 14 to like 19, um, how can your art or a lot of art that at least perpetuates positive images of lesbian women, how do you feel like those actively transgress the different ways in which we're learning to relate to each other. You know, I have young women who are finding themselves in safer spaces and they're queer, you know, and they can be with each other when they're not with their parents, right? But then also in private, that young person can call me at seven o'clock in the morning and say, my girlfriend and I just got in a physical fight, right? And that is something that is kind of brushed under the ground, not really seen as domestic violence. Um, and people just kind of see it as like this altercation between girls, because girls are petty, girls have drama, and that's what it is, right? And their relationship or their interaction is not even valued. So in looking you know, at your art, I definitely see like a visual representation of a lot of mature images, you know? N not necessarily something that I feel like 
a 14 year old, you know, would be able to go home with and feel comfortable like opening and, and, and just start a conversation with her parent, you know, but how, how do you feel like your art or other people's art can maybe shift the way women are learning to relate to each other, especially when it comes to images of how we relate to our bodies or how we consent to other women relating to our bodies, especially if we're talking about lesbian women because the sexual assault kind of can get flipped on the head too in that sense. Uh, what you're seeing here is for, because then I'm at that age, you know, it's for my age group and any age group over 18. And I don't shoot people who are under age. So what you're seeing here is just half the picture, not the complete picture. There are other projects that I'm involved in, um, which are not necessarily what you're seeing here. This are selected from a number of documents to suit this particular issue of state of activism, of visual activism. Um, what we have done, like Terra is another generation, is in her 20s or so, and they also are the young women that I work with who are in the same age group, who are born around about uh, 1990 and below. And I have created structures in which people speak with one generation to the next generation. And we started a, a project in one of the girls' schools in Soweto, in a, in a girls-only school in Aurora. We gave girls cameras, and then Tara and some of the uh, of Inkanyiso members, they teach those girls, including a, a friend of ours who is not a lesbian, she's a mother of four, and she's an ally. And she teach girls how they could use visuals to speak their truths and also to relate to their day-to-day -day life. So it means that um, youth get to speak to each other and also use the image or visuals to relate to a, a number of things. Maybe here bullying is a common thing. With our girls, the common problem was teenage pregnancy. We spoke about that and also the coming out. We don't have LGBTI groups like here. You find that other people, they want to come out as teenagers, but then due to high, um, uh, due to rampant hate crimes, it's not easy to say to a person who's 14, just do it and just be. Because if that kid is chased away from home, where will I house her? There are no shelters for lesbians specifically like how you have here. So it means that one needs to be super careful in terms of like how do they read my images, my body and a young girl's body and how those relate. Maybe it will be when she start maturing and she start having her menstruation and so on and so on. I could speak to that child besides speaking to her about my sexuality of how a woman become you know, a matured being in that way. If I can't deal with that case, I refer that case to experts who deal with such. I can't claim to know everything. So each and every one of us have something to share. So if I can't deal with that matter, there are friends who, who work in different structures that I could always refer the cases to. I don't work alone, I work with a number of people. I have not specifically worked with underage, the project that I started last year is with Aurora, and also years before where people, sometimes they lie about their age because they want to fit in or they want to make with adults, and you find that a person looks older and yet she's younger. But the minute we discover that the person is young, she'll have to be out of our spaces because we don't want other people or other adults say we promote lesbianism or we promote homosexuality. In, with that said, we're super careful with the youngsters that we mix with, and especially when they are not out from their homes. But any other child, any other girl, there are a lot of centers, there are other people who are not maybe in those non-profit organizations dealing with that. Those who know how to deal with such cases, we then refer to them because they know how to deal with them. Yeah. about the situation of gay men. Oh, sorry. Would you share a bit about the situation of gay men in townships in South Africa, particularly gay men who may uh, ha have a manner that others would define as fe effeminate, and how susceptible are they to the, uh, rape or uh, any other kind of violence? Anything that you 
would like to share, I'd like to hear. I've had the privilege of spending some time in townships in South Africa, and I'm a gay man. My gaydar wasn't very successful at that point. It was in the 90s, mostly, and I th suspect the situation has changed a lot since then. Thank you. Cool. It's so difficult to speak on, <laughs> to speak on uh, or to speak about gay men. Uh, we mix a lot with a lot of gay men in the townships because we document in various townships a lot. But also to say that gay men in different parts of the country are different, obviously. The hate crime that is happening in South Africa now, we've heard of early cases of hate crime in which gay men were targets of hate crimes, just to give you some picture. And there was a case, I work for Behind the Mask, which was an online magazine uh, that reported on, on LGBTI affairs in Africa as a whole. And uh, Damon Bolden happened to be one of my colleagues or a person who worked in the project after I, I just left. Um, unlike in other cases, you find there are cases where lesbians don't mix with gay men, and then you find in other cases where gay men mix with lesbians because they grew up with them, or maybe they work with them, or we happen to be from the same township. Um, when I did my research in different townships, I realized that what bearing of lesbians and so on and so on existed, but then not many of those cases made it to the mainstream media, like how the lesbian hate crimes are like right now. One of the most brutal cases when we speak of gay men in any space is the case that happened at Sizzlers in Cape Town where about six gay men were butchered and they were killed at a go. And that was in 2003, around that period. And then we know of cases uh, of, of other gay men who are members of different churches. You know, like the church become that central space where I meet a lot of gay men or beauty pageants. Right now, the space that has a lot of out trans uh, women and also feminine gay men is Daviton because I work with one of the girls there and uh, her name is Lisiba. She organizes a lot of beauty pageants in which the girls, they enter the, for the beauty uh, uh, crown or something. So I work with them and I, I photograph them for my beauty series. So people are there and they make do with whatever that they have and it's so unfortunate that they do not get the support that they need in order to sustain themselves and also to write their life stories. But we are there. And a situation of a feminine gay man or a gay man who is black and living in the fringes of the society like deep rural areas of KZN, do not, those people do not have the same access like people who are living in, in urban areas. So sometimes it's difficult to have much access to their, to their pictures and also stories, etc., etc. Otherwise we are everywhere. But then it's a matter of getting that one link which then connects the dots with many other dots. I, I go to VMCI, which is a church headed by Pastor Zungu, who is one of my collaborators and the founding member of the most um, uh, prominent churches in Durban. So the church is connected to a lot of spiritual activists who are gay men and members of the church or who are gay friendly and connected with many. And the church, right there at the church, you have trans women and also gay men who are dedicated members of the church who are not your typical flamboyant gay boys that you'll find at, club, uh, at night clubs, but who love and believe in God. So there are different dynamics in different spaces from the night clubs to the beauty pageants to the church. I get to meet most of them because I move around. Um, before we move on to the next question, I do want to say that some of the participants um, in Zanelli's work are in the audience tonight, and I want to offer up this opportunity if any of them want to come on stage and participate in the conversation. Um, I think that would be great. Yeah. Um, I have Makesh and Pastor Zungu who are here with me. Uh, please, guys, come forward. And then Tara is wearing a rainbow cap. Um, unfortunately, she's documenting, otherwise she's here to respond and her picture is upstairs and I've been with Tara for five years now. Uh, we keep on documenting and documenting. Uh, these guys are jet-lagged, but 
<laughs> I think they'll get back to normal now. But, yes. Sure. Thanks, thanks. Uh, what's that? Uh, this is uh, Makesh, who is partnered or life partner to Zungu. Um, this is our mother of the church. We call her the first lady of the church, like how you have the first lady, Michelle Obama. <laughs> <laughs> and she performed last night. She was one of my collaborators for the performance last night for those who were here. These are the people who give me support, emotionally support when things are not tuning. When I need God, I have to travel with members of my uh, crew and we, we, we drive for about 600 kilometers just to be at the church that makes sense to us. So this is Pastor uh, Zungu and that's Mrs. Zungu. They both legally married and their pictures are upstairs as well. So for any questions, and if you have also questions for Tara, please feel free to ask her. Yeah. Good evening. Yeah. Thank you for being here. I um, had heard of the event through um, Information Online, and I immediately wanted to come because it was about LGBTQ community in South Africa. And I'm like, well, how can that be? They have a community? Because you could die. You know, because that's what I know here, that if you come out as being LGBTQ in Africa or Caribbean, or the Caribbean, you can die. So you all are so very courageous. And then listening to Stacy and Chin being reminded of the fact that that can happen anywhere in the world, here in New York, in Brooklyn, New Jersey, where I'm from, everywhere. And um, so I'm just very um, intrigued by like your, your, your strength and, and how you do come together. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm scared all the time here. And I think it's mainly because you know, I was unfortunately one of those children who was raped as a child. So I'm always aware that I could be hurt at any time and I'm never protected or safe. And you know, coming out and being a lesbian, being out in the world, you know, I'm always aware of having to be alert about everything that's going on around me. And, you know, just to hear, you know, I can't wait to go upstairs and see the images, but um, that's what I, like, how do you do it? Like, what is it like to be free within the constraints of the country and how they feel about LGBTQ people? I greet you all. Um, my name is Makesh. Um, I'm married to Pastor Zungu. Uh, we've been together for 15 years. Uh, it's not easy, yeah, in South Africa, but with God, with God helps, uh, I mean, we are fine. We're trying by all means because um, we love God. And we just told ourselves that uh, no matter what may come, but nothing can disturb us. Uh, we're leading a church, a church and we are the founders of um, Victoria's Ministers Church International, which is the first um, friendly gay church in South Africa. We started in 2005. Uh, it was not easy, and it started to be okay in 20, 2011. Yeah, but it not, it's, it's not easy. But we are praising, and the number is going, is, is, is growing up each and every, every Sunday. It is growing, and we are a born again Christian church. Yeah. And the, um, I don't know where to start. Uh, the thing is that I always become emotional, but I'll try to talk. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, Zanele is, the, is one of the members of our church. She always travels, and I'm so happy because this is my first time here in New York because of Zanelem Holly, and I'm so happy to see her job, what is doing here, and I believe and praying that one day this can happen also in South Africa. Um, I, I would like to thank everyone who's here, who's been supporting the whole week. I'm so overwhelmed. 
and I love you all guys. And I'm a proudly black lesbian. I love God and I'm a Christian. More questions? Sure. Uh, to respond to your question, Funega said, whenever somebody is killed, another one of us is born. So each time a lesbian is buried, another lesbian is born the very same minute. So they never stop us, they never finish us, will never be erased in history or in any space. We are here, we are you, and we'll never go anywhere. My comment, um, you said that you're, I don't know if you said proud, but I hear proud, a proud black lesbian woman yes. who loves God. Yes. And pardon? Yes. 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 And I remember years ago, I had attended a Unity Church here in the city that had uh, Reverend Pastor Regina Holland. And that's what I needed to hear. Like, I would go there every week to hear her say, um, God didn't make any mistakes. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, what is it? I can't even think of it now. But she would just say, God didn't make any mistakes. You know, your love. And I needed to hear that and, and the connection um, to the church and to God, which I'm still seeking, trying to find even in, in, in New York, a church that I can, um, mm -hmm. well, in Jersey, I think I have to come to New York, a church that I can attend, where I can be with other LGBTQ people and, and, and worship freely and be who I am in the church. Yeah, it's yeah. so important mm -hmm. to have that community. Mm -hmm. Um, I think since we came here, we've met uh, Pastor Vanessa Brown. There is also a church here that we attended last Sunday. And they are also born again Christians. Is Pastor Brown here tonight? Or the church is called Rivers of Water. Yeah, we went there last Sunday. Yeah, that's yes, where we, No, yes. here in town. Here. In the city. Yes. New York City. Uh, not in Harlem. New York City. In town. Yes, yes. yeah. <laughs> Manhattan. Oh, yeah. Oh. Okay. I don't know this place. <laughs> so, like, city center, as in, like, 38th Street? Okay. Yeah. Broadway, 238? Where is that? Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay, it's in Manhattan. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing that I want to say, for those of you who haven't seen the show upstairs, of course, you have to go see it. It's, it's, really, it's really amazing. And one thing that really strikes me about it is just seeing all of these faces, these dozens and dozens of women on this wall, in this way, in this institution. It really has this presence about it um, that shows you that it's not just about one individual story. We're not just talking about like this one narrative. It's visualizing an entire community of people. Um, and it also shows them in this very human way. So we have images and we have work that is about funerals, about weddings, um, about people interacting with each other and having relationships, which I think shows it's not just you have this thought of a black queer lesbian in South Africa and you think of maybe brutality. It's not just that. They're human beings, whole, well-rounded, who love each other, who love, who are loved by people. And I think that's a really important point that this work really points out, which I think is just really beautiful and amazing. Um, that was not a question. That was just a statement that I want to say about the work. Um, but, but if you could, just for a second, just say what does it mean to you to have this work in an institution like that, in front of people, in front of these eyes? Um, what does it mean to have this work, this activist work, um, featuring these faces, these stunning portraits of this community in the Brooklyn Museum? Like, what is, what is the importance of that? Okay, um, there's somebody who raised their hand, but I'll respond. Okay. You, okay, sure. Yeah. You start with that? Yeah? Uh, yeah, we can answer this question okay, first sure. when they go over here. Cool. Uh, I almost called my mom, and I realized that actually she died in 2009. 
And it's to say, oh my God, mom, I'm here. I'm here, not only in Brooklyn, but I'm at Brooklyn Museum, you know? Because then whatever that we're doing, we're doing it for our, for our mothers, mothers, and for our grandchildren, and for our great, great, great grandchildren. And I'm not here at Brooklyn Museum alone. There are so many forces who are at this space, at this particular period in our history. I'm here as South Africa celebrate 21 years of democracy. And which means that I've never been given a space like Stacey Ann said, as powerful as this one at home. No, I've been given some chance, but not as massive as this one. So, and it basically means that these spaces are possible. Mm -hmm. When I started working as a visual activist, as a photographer, there are so many places there that I never thought um, I could showcase my work. And Brooklyn Museum was not even on my list. But then with time and how things shaped, and also with the support of friends and girlfriends and ex-girlfriends, and, men, and many people who embrace and believe in me. Um, I have a best friend here in New York. Her name is Ellen uh, Eisenman. She's been my pillar of strength. She, she quite understands what I want, especially when I cannot articulate myself, when I feel like I could speak to someone in Zulu. Can somebody understand what I'm trying to achieve? And she managed to fix most of the work that is, um, is on this show. I don't want to lie to you. This is a dream come true. Um, not for only me, but paving the way for many young and old black lesbians to know that this is the time and this space is possible. Because I don't know how many black lesbians who have showcased here who come from Africa especially the height of homophobia and xenophobia in Africa, in Europe, and different parts of the world. I don't know how many of them. And it basically says that we have, not me, because I, I don't photograph myself. Maybe you might see my portrait in this, that's me. But presenting the work of more than 250 black lesbians in one space, or even been given the two minutes to project them at Brooklyn Museum. I don't know what other gift will I ask for beyond this because, like how Makesh said, she's overwhelmed. Um, I don't know, I really don't know what to say. I'm truly honored and truly grateful and the support that I got from the sisters in the, at the uh, education department here who look just like me, who made me feel like I'm at home. I'm truly, truly honored, guys. And I wish my sisters were here to see, you know, the sameness that we share. So I'm really, really, really grateful. I might not be here next week, I might not be here next month, but the fact that we were given that opportunity to shine in as much as we still face different kind of prejudices and challenges, but the fact that we exist and we're given a space to be exhibited and to share our stories, because it's not only my story, but we are many, including Tara, including the Zungus, including many other friends who are back at home that I'm indebted to for giving me the opportunity to photograph them. I'm really, really thankful. You know, from within, there is no other period, you know, to say this. Yabonga in Zulu, and I'll also say Siabonga, which means um, we are grateful, not alone, with all of us. And with your support, and support doesn't mean only finance, but it means emotional support as well, which we need the most. Um, please continue to give us that support because we need each other. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that that 
is a great spot to end it on. Thank you so much to Zanelli Maholi for being here in this space with us, for talking with us, for sharing this work, for making this work, um, for the participants, for making this work as well. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. This has been great. Thank you all. Thanks to you. Thank you so much to Tatiana for holding it down as a moderator this okay, evening. Thank you to Zanelli. Thank you to all the participants. Do you want to? Okay, one word, please. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much for everything. Uh, it is awesome. Uh, as a pastor, I'd like to say one word. You know, God didn't make any mistake. Any mistake. Um, even if people, they can say negative things about you, don't even bother. God says uh, in his word, uh, he loved us. He created us. He gave his only begotten son so that whosoever uh, believe in his word will be saved, irrespective of gender, irrespective of who we are, irrespective of race, irrespective of sexuality. So we must stand firm, stand boldly, and praise the Lord. We are so unique and special to God, just like the flowers. If you mix the flowers, you take the red roses, green one, a white one, it will make the beautiful, beautiful flower. So we are, no, we are not the same when God creates us. But it doesn't mean that we are crooked. I always said we are more than straight because we understand ourselves clearly. Thank you. I feel so honored and grateful to be participating and working for an institution that honors and values and uplifts and provides a voice for marginalized and underrepresented people within the world. And I think that tonight's conversation is truly a representation of what is possible. I totally agree with you, Zanelli. Thank you so much for saying that. I definitely want to thank um, the Sackler Center for Feminist Art for presenting such work, because I think that the work that's being presented within the Feminist Art Center continues to challenge our ideals about what is possible and provides a space and a voice for all people. Um, I definitely want to thank the Education Division, because we work really, really hard to present these pro programs like this, as well as teacher packets and classes with our students, with teenagers. We are in the room right now. We work with people all day, every day, and we're clearly wanting to provide space for conversations and dialogues like this. Um, in addition to that, I also want to thank our AV staff, the live stream, the electricians, the assistant maintainers, because without all of that, none of this is possible either. And I just really want to just provide a space for us to continue the conversation and the dialogue, to connect and c create with one another, use the hashtag queer trans activism, let's continue this conversation. We have a, a me email list in the back that I would love to invite you to sign up on, specifically for programs that are gonna be related to this exhibition. Uh, we're gonna be having programs all the way through until the beginning of November. One in particular that I wanna shout out is Rethinking Gender, Narratives That Reveal New Past, which is gonna be on Saturday, October 24th from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, we're also going to have a portraiture workshop that is also going to be um, mimicking Zanelli's process and then also creating opportunity to make our own zine so that we can continue to tell our narratives and our stories no matter what background you are. And um, there's going to be a lot of other programs throughout the summer, so please continue to support the Brooklyn Museum. Thank you, Zanelli, for uplifting us. I'm just so grateful for you and I'm grateful for all of the participants and I'm grateful for Tatiana and Stacey and Chin and I just wish you all a wonderful evening. I hope that you can nourish yourselves and please let's stay connected and stay in touch and thank you, thank you so much for coming tonight.